got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I feature inspirational entrepreneurs, leaders, some founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. I'm excited to introduce one of my favorite people and business women I know and, and business people I know in general, um, Andrea Houston of Art Juice Design. Before I do, you know, there's a couple of past episodes, Andrea, I always like to point out. Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark grew her company to $20 million with five employees, sold to Disney. But the most impressive part was she beat cancer twice. And that was amazing, uh, her journey on that. Um, Tara Bosch uh, from Smart Suites. Thanks, John Rulin, for the introduction. Tara, at a very young age, I don't even, I don't know how old she was, Andrea, but she created, uh, you know, Smart Suites, which basically is to eliminate processed sugar. And she is a healthy gummy bear or a healthy Swedish fish. At a young age, she went to disrupt the candy industry, raised $3.6 million. Um, and got her business off the ground is in more than, I mean, at the time, this was a while ago, 10,000 stores. She was in Target, Whole Foods at a young age. So if you think you can't do something, um, I like to feature top women entrepreneurs in general. And um, this brings me to Andrea and what she does. But um, if you haven't checked out, um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with John Corker and my business partner. And we help businesses connect to their dream 100 people, their best referral partners, their best relationships, and give to them through bringing them on a podcast. So we help businesses launch and run your podcast um, and give to your best relationships, okay? Um, and I won't tell the full story, and I think, Andrew, you already know this, but it was really inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and his legacy lives on because um, an interview was done by the Holocaust Foundation. So you can go to inspiredinsider.com. Check out the about page. The full interview is there. Anyone can watch it. Um, it really inspires me to do better, to do more, and give. So if you have questions about podcasting, go to Rise25. Um, today's guest, really excited to have. It's been long awaited. Uh, Andrea Houston is the host of Lead Like a Woman show, where she features strong women leaders changing the world. They have over 40,000 people on social media sharing their empowering message with other people. Well, leaders, and you can check out leadlikeawoman.biz. If you're watching the video right now, you can see her webpage right there, Empowering Women Leaders to Empower Others. Um, and she also uh, founded Artitude's Design, and for over 25 years, they've been creating visual communication for Fortune 500 companies, Microsoft, Starbucks, Expedia, um, even startups and nonprofits, and they specialize in presentation training, PowerPoint, graphic design, virtual and live events, and much more. You can go to artitudesdesign.com. This is when I'd be quiet, Andrea, and thank you for coming. <laughs> awesome, Jeremy. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. This has been a long time coming. Uh, we've yeah. talked about it before, but I'm just really excited for the conversation today. Me too. And and I talk about the front. I mentioned, you know, Julie Clark in particular, there's life altering events and there's a crazy journey with entrepreneurs that become, there are life events that are crazy that you know, overlay into the crazies of business. And you have these four life altering events that have tested your resiliency, which makes you even more amazing if people don't know you. Um, what are, can you tell people those, what are those four events? Sure, there's at least four, but we'll go with four right now. Yeah, we'll go big, 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 <laughs> big, big, big events. Yeah. Exactly. So I would say the very first one harkens back to when we were trying to start a family and we went through almost four years of infertility treatments, including mm. surgery after surgery for me, uh, many different things that we did to try to have kids on our own uh, and it never happened. So what we did do was we adopted and we adopted two beautiful, handsome, wonderful boys who are brothers. And we got them both at birth um, through an adoption agency here in Washington state on the Eastern side of the state called um, in Spokane. Uh, the thing is we adopted our boys um, from a drug addicted birth mother. And mm. so she, we found out when she was eight months pregnant with our first son, uh, the state called us and said she had been arrested for drinking. She was drunk and disorderly and we had no idea what to do at that time. But they said, you may want to seriously consider whether you want to adopt this baby or not. Um, and after some thought and some 
talk and we decided this baby was meant to be ours. So we went ahead with the adoption. Uh, and he is amazing, but he came out with some issues. He was born with some issues um, because of the fact that she abused drugs and drank a lot. So he has mm. fetal cocaine effect, which manifests itself like high ADHD or low Asperger's. Mm. Um, and it's, it's really been hard for him all his life for learning. Now, when Owen was born, our second son, uh, she was not using. And so they are birth brothers. They're the same birth mother. Oh, wow. Yeah. So when I used to send her flowers for Aiden's birthday, and so I couldn't get a hold of her. And I, I could always find her through her grandmother. So I called her grandmother and said, I can't find her again. And she said, just a minute, because she knew I wanted to send her flowers. And I thought she was going to get her address, but she came on the phone. <laughs> Um, and the birth mother said, Hey, Andrea, do you want another baby? And I said, um, I don't know, maybe. And she said, well, I'm due, uh, with a little boy on August 27th. Now this was a little over two and a half months away from when I was on the phone with her. And that was our 10th wedding anniversary. So without hanging the phone up and calling Eric, my husband, I said, of course we would. I took it as a sign. <laughs> <laughs> and what did he say when he came home or you talked to him and go, by the way, well, I said, hey, honey, we're having a baby. He goes, we're what? I didn't think that was possible. I said, nope, we're doing it another way. And he's due in two and a half months. So he was thrilled. We were both absolutely thrilled. And they are the loves of my life, these boys. They're amazing. Mm. In fact, my oldest just graduated from high school last Friday. So it's very exciting. Because, thanks. Education had been super hard for him. It was very difficult. Wow. And then I talked a little bit about the infertility. And we didn't know why I had such infertility problems. But... I had um, some health issues and it ended up, I had to have a hysterectomy and they noticed I had the worst endometriosis they'd ever seen, the doctor said. So he took pictures of my insides and asked me to sign a model release. So I'm in textbooks nationwide now. It's very exciting. I've always wanted to be. I don't know if right. that's what people want to be in no. books for, but. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, uh, but in the series of um, surgeries I had, I had a surgery go wrong. Uh, and I was in a coma for 19 days in June, <laughs> right now in June of 2008. Uh, and that was touch and go. I got something called ARDS. I aspirated on the operating table, it turned to pneumonia. And within a day, it was acute respiratory distress syndrome, which at the time had a 70% fatality rate. It's down to about 50% now, which is great. Uh, but they prepared my husband for my death three times. It was very Crazy. intense and very, yeah, it's just in, in light of everything that's going on in the world right now, a lot of the people who are dying of COVID are dying of ARDS. So it's, it's where your lungs turn to stone and you just absolutely can't get air. You're suffocating in your own body. So that was a huge life altering event for me. Yeah. It changed everything. It changed everything for me about the way that I parent, the way that I show up, the way that I run a business, the way that I talk to friends. Every single moment is precious because I'm above ground. And it really has stayed with me. Uh, and then six years ago in August, our house burned down. Well, the kids so real and I quick, were Andrea, I want to oh, point yeah. out <laughs> that um, for these, if you want to hear like the full, full, full story of them, they should go to leadlikeawoman.biz. Check out the podcast. You can see right here, Empowering Women Leaders. She talks about this in depth and obviously more stories from other female uh, leaders. So check those out on the podcast. So anyways... I don't want to interrupt your house burning down. So <laughs> no, please do. I mean, it was horrifying. Yeah. So it was August of 2014 and I was there with the boys. We have a beach house. It was a beach cabin at the time. And I spent, we spent about three months there every year and we had just gone down to spend August there. We spent the whole month plus some, so it was around five and a half weeks and we'd only been there two days and it was kind of a beautiful sunny day, but the clouds and the fog were rolling in because we live at the ocean and it gets that way. So I had started a fire in the fireplace with like a Presto log type thing. Uh, and within half an hour, or maybe a little longer than that, I heard the loudest noise I've ever heard. It sounded like a jet airplane was landing on my roof. Uh, it was a little after nine. So both boys were in bed and I went, what's that noise? <laughs> 
<laughs> so somebody was driving up my driveway, honking their horn in a pickup truck. And he's like, you have a chimney fire. So I ran inside and I dumped a coffee pot full of water on the fire um, and another coffee pot full. And then I walked outside to the deck and I looked up and it was just smoke. So it looked fine. All was good. Came back in the house and tried to get a hold of my husband because he was playing um, playing cards with his friends and I couldn't get a hold of me when answered the phone. So I called, he was at our best friend's house and I called my friend and I said, I need Eric to call me. I think I just had a chimney fire. So he called me back and he goes, I need you to go look again. So with him on the phone, I walked out to the back deck and saw nothing. I walked down because it's three stories up. So I walked down the driveway and looked up nothing. And I thought, all right, I'll just walk out the path a little ways. So I walked out the path to the beach and I looked up and there was a patch of fire about this big, maybe bigger, on the roof in the cedar shake shingles. Wow. And I said, oh, Eric, we have a fire. Got to go. So I hung up on him and I called 911. And while I'm on the phone with 911, I'm running up the stairs to get the kids out of bed. And we end up, I grab a bag, which I thought was my tennis shoes because I knew I needed shoes. I was in my pajamas. I had flip flops on. We were all ready for bed. Um, and I grabbed a bag that I thought was my shoes and we ran outside and my oldest son came out wearing a zip up fleece, uh, flip flops and underwear. So I was like, uh, we're going back in the house. So he, to this day, he says I scarred him, but I went back with him in the house so he could get some clothes. <laughs> uh, and then we went outside and just waited. Now the bag that I had grabbed wasn't tennis shoes. I was lucky it was my laptop from work um, because they were both in little cinch bags and I just grabbed the wrong one, which turned out to be the right one. Uh, but it was a pretty intense time. Um, I made the call to 911, but they didn't realize that I was there for some reason. It's just the, you know, 911 operators to the fire department, to the police department. So we stood across the street uh, in the neighbor's driveway and watched the house burn for almost two hours before the police re realized we were there. I had no purse. I had no shoes. I had no car keys. Uh, and my car, I had had the presence of mind and I don't know when or how to move the car to the neighbor's driveway because I had a convertible I left. And I remember thinking, I got to save the car. Boys, stay right here. Um, but I had put everything in the trunk of the car. So I'd locked my keys in the car here. So I had mm -hmm. no way to get out, but it was a five alarm fire and they blocked off the entire road. So I couldn't have gotten out if I tried. So about two hours in a, a police... Uh, truck drives up and he goes, are you the homeowner? Said, yeah, we're the homeowners. We're standing here in the cold, crying our eyes out. And he went, oh my God, we didn't know you were here. Get in the back of my car. So they drove us to a local hotel where um, the hotel gave us a night free until I could figure out my <laughs> money situation. My husband drove down and made, us th made it there about midnight that night from his poker game. And by the next morning, we had friends converge on us who had heard about the fire, bringing us toothbrushes and underwear and clothes and food and anything we needed, even though it was two and a half hours away from our family and friends. So that was a pretty big event. It took well, good a year thing he built. said, go check uh, again, because then you would yeah. have been in, the, been in the house as opposed to watching it burn from the outside. Yep. Well, and yeah. the, the interesting, interesting thing, the sad thing. Um, so like I said, it's, it's a three-story house and the top story burned down. And the roof fell in on the kids' bunk beds where they were sleeping. Mm. It was very, very scary. We lost everything in the house. What we didn't lose to fire, we lost to smoke and water. Wow. So we rebuilt from the ground up, and now it's a house. Before it was a cabin, a beach cabin. Now it's a beach house. And we have the best insurance in the country. So USAA saved us and literally pulled our butts out of the fire. Hmm. Yeah. And then Intense. if that wasn't enough, there's one more life-altering event. Yeah. So after my coma, I had decided that I could give responsibility to my staff because they were very good at what they did. And I didn't have to run every piece of the company anymore. Before I was ill, I had responsibility for 85% of the clients that came through the door. So I, you know, I divided it up. I was the strategic person, sales and the director of culture, but we had an employee who started, um, when I was ill, actually, who became our senior project manager and one of our project managers, and he was freaking amazing. Um, he was great with our clients, but by the time he left, he owned 85% of the relationships and he died quite suddenly. So oh. he was 42 years old and he died of colon cancer, uh, leaving three kids, um, all under the age of 10. He was my neighbor. 
for 12 years. He worked for me for nine years and we'd known each other for 15 and we were good friends. And it just cut me off at the knees. And I didn't feel like I was allowed to be sad because he was a neighbor and an employee and a friend. Whereas his wife and his family who lived four doors away were really, really struggling. And so I ended up realizing and being diagnosed as uh, depressed about eight months later. And in the time Mm -hmm. from his death, uh, or when he left the company in January, um, three years ago to the time I was diagnosed, we lost $600,000 in revenue that year. Cause I simply didn't care. And I had to pull my head out of the sand and care mm-hmm. again if I was going to have a company and people were going to have a paycheck. So I did, and we're okay. It's been a, we rebuilt ever since. And then this year hits and everything's up in the air. That's okay. We're doing all right. You at the time, you know, I always like to ask in general, since it's the parents how does someone push through tough challenges? And at that point, you know, you've had all these things hit and then this happens to a friend and staff member. How, what did you do to pull your head out of the sand? I mean, it's not, it's easier said than done, you know? It is. So it was hidden from me. I know that sounds strange. I didn't realize I was depressed because I wake up every day grateful to be on earth. And I really hold that thought. I have a practice of gratitude every day and I focus on what I'm grateful for and how grateful I am for the air in my lungs. So not only did I not feel like I was allowed to be sad, but I also felt like, no, I'm not sad. There's no sad, I'm not sad. I'm sad that he passed away, but I'm fine. You know, things are okay. Mm. And I actually had to realize it and have a doctor tell me first that I was depressed because I was showing signs of depression for me to actually recognize it and go, wait, I can fix this or there's a way I can get through it and I can help the company. So I took over a lot of the work again uh, and a lot of the relationships as well. And I was like, I was able to rebuild. We, we didn't get them all back because you wouldn't, you know, people yeah. moved on and, and we failed. We failed to be good at customer service for a while. We failed at the relationship portion, which we really are good at. So it's, I mean, it's been a build. It's been rebuilding step by step by step and brick by brick. And that's difficult for me because I'm not very patient. I like things to move fast. I like results. So this brick by brick stuff, is not fun, but we've been doing well and we're doing better now. Let's, I want to talk about virtual events because in this shift of this environment we're in and whenever someone's listening, there's always going to be some kind of crisis going on. It doesn't matter, right? Um, but there's specifically uh, virtual events um, and St. Michelle Wine Estates. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Oh, I adore this client. I really actually love all my clients. I'll say that, but this is one of my favorites. Um, I have kept... St. Michelle Wine Estates is my own personal client instead of passing it off to one of my project managers because I enjoy working with them so much. They're a lot of fun and it's very creative. So they came to us. We do a lot of their event work and we have for about seven years now. And they came to us and they wanted us to produce a show internally for June 24th with all their internal people, which means on three different continents with lots of different stakeholders. And I said, it's not going to (laughs) happen. I said, we can give you a plan for an on-site event, but I think you need a backup as a virtual event. And over a few days of talking, we finally got them to realize it needed to be virtual. And what we did is instead of rolling out all of their new content and they're kind of closing the book on the last 50 years and going forward now for what's in the future, we are creating a series of videos that is almost like a Netflix series or TV series. Um, that will release over three seasons, but it's only going to be through six to seven weeks of time where mm. they'll see a new uh, a new video or a new episode almost daily for a few weeks. Mm. And so we punted to create this content that now can be evergreen, now can be stored, now can be used when people come into the company uh, or when they're doing advertising or anything else. So you get a lot more value out of what you're doing in this case than if we'd had a live event. Mm. So, so we're what, knee deep in it now. It's fun. This is a great project. What What do you think, you know, because oftentimes with these shifts comes opportunity, right? So what, what do you see as the opportunity that will come out? Because they would have never done this otherwise. Right. right. And by the way, this is the right site I'm looking at. Is this? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. I shopped with St. Michelle. So St. Michelle it. Wine Estates is owned by a larger company in the South, but they have wineries and wine partnerships all over the world. Hmm. 
And you know what? We've done live events for them for many years and they're amazing. We have so much fun. Last year, we up-leveled everything for them with a live event and they loved it. But right now is not the time for that. We will come back to live events, but I don't think they'll be to the same degree. I don't think we'll do as many because virtual events can reach more stakeholders because we are spread apart nationally and internationally. And because we have people perhaps with access issues who couldn't come to a live event, we can now hit bigger audiences deeper audiences with more content. Sometimes when you have a talking head on a stage, it's impactful, but it's not as impactful as being able to review something over and over again to get it to stick in your head. Yeah. So I think virtual events is where we're going. This is the future of events. And there's a lot of companies who are stepping up to the plate to do it really well. And we are one of them. In fact, I had a call this morning with four other companies all over the country about creating a live event package for some of our clients with localization services, with uh, speaker coaching, with all sorts of different bells and whistles that'll bring it all together into a much more impactful event, a much more impactful thing for people to see and ingest. What should I ing- yeah, people make sure to have in their virtual event. Like what are some you know pieces that are must haves? Mm-hmm. It's a very, very good question, Jeremy. Um, Really, interaction. So people have online with Zoom, I am learning that people have about a 12 and a half minute attention span, which is crazy. Uh, But there's, they really say it's 25 minutes, but you're going to start losing people around 12 and a half minutes where they're going to go, huh, I'm going to check my email now, or I'm going to do this, or, you know, let me just turn my, my video off so no one can see me while I eat, that kind of thing which I understand and we have to understand going forward, but you need more interaction. So that comes in the form of rooms where people can go to and have more uh, intimate conversations and then come back to a larger group. A lot of mm. people think that Q&A is the one big thing you should do. I don't actually think so. I think Q&A is important, but it needs to be moderated. And it's best if it's scripted in a case like that, where you can pull people ahead of time and then ask questions. One thing I would say in a virtual event that's really, really good is to pre-record your video. Um, what I have learned is you pre-record in small sections, you give the video out, and then you do an exercise. And then you have live Q&A. So there's still the interactivity. Mm. One of the other things we're doing is we're doing uh, technology drops or swag drops to people who are in the audience so that there can be some interaction. So you get a box full of goodies and you're having this virtual event and the moderator says, okay, you get to open Mm. package one. That's cool. Yeah. And then you can do something with it so it becomes an interactive presentation. The more people do for themselves, obviously it's like writing makes you remember things better, but the more people can do and interact for themselves, the more they will ingest the content. So actually still having the physical swag bag there. And then it's, I bet it's probably more impactful because usually you just go to an event, you get it, you kind of piece through it. Maybe like, (laughs) when you get home, you like dump it on the bed and like spread yeah. it out type of thing. But this is if someone's specifically saying, okay, go here, pull this out. Here's mm-hmm. what this is for. It's probably way more impactful than how we do it in an event. Yes. And it's curated better. So instead of saying to your event vendors, put something in the goodie bag, it's not, that's not valuable. And it's, it's never been really valuable to be honest. It's an advertising opportunity, but this way you're curating things that are valuable to both the content and the person receiving them. Mm. And so it becomes something that they want to keep. It becomes something they refer back to. It becomes something that hallmarks a memory or helps you remember what, the, what was discussed or the content that you ingested. You know, um, you, you know, Andrea, if someone goes to artitudesdesign.com, they can see uh, the different um, aspects and different things that you do. One of the things I wanted to talk with you about is presentations. And yes. um, because you guys are a master at presentation design and training. So yes. what are some of the aspects that from a, a training perspective what should people make sure to either have in or what do you instruct them that would make their their presentation more powerful? So the things to tell people about presentations or to train them on how to give a good presentation, there's all sorts of different things. But if we're talking about what's on the screen, mm-hmm. and that's one thing I want to address right now is 
take your words off your screen. That's the very first thing I would tell you. I will challenge my speakers to have no words on the screen because mm. really that means we'll end up with a few words on the screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, that's, and that's fine. Is but it so people are not paying attention to your slides or paying attention to you? Is that Yes. Why? Because really your presentation or your video or whatever is going on behind you or beside you should only emphasize your message. The main mm. message comes from the speaker and it's vitally important that that comes across. I mean, otherwise, what's the point? So the, the presentation of the video should win the award for best supporting actor or actress, but mm. the speaker should win the award for the best actor or actress. Mm. I love that. Yeah, as you could see some of this, uh, if anyone's watching the video, you could see like the, the, some of the visual images that will tell a story, but the person will tell the story. Exactly. It's just to emphasize a point. I am terrible at this, Andrea, so I need to listen to your advice. <laughs> I mean, to put way too many words on here. I like this one, 1 billion Windows 10 devices. See, look at this that. This is a good and one. And it's impactful. Yeah, yeah, I love that one. Um, so from a visual perspective, what about from a, um, a delivery perspective? What are things that people should be aware of when they're delivering a presentation? Well, in a virtual world, I tell people to look at the camera and not at the screen and not at the people on the screen. So say you're in a Zoom room or a WebEx or any other piece of software that's helping you present, you can turn off self-view. Don't look at yourself. Mm. Look at look at the webcam. So I have a little arrow at the top of my laptop that points yeah. to it so that I remember mm -hmm. to look at it. Now, I don't mm -hmm. always do it. But it's really important that you do that because then it looks like you're interacting with the audience. It feels really strange for the speaker. Because yeah, you can't you're see right. It. I've yeah. seen people and I was like wondering, I was watching this video of someone and I was like, <laughs> why do they look down like this is because I think they had it on their phone in on front their of phone. them yeah. and they were looking down like this, but the camera was coming from their computer yeah. and I thought they were ignoring the people the whole time but i realized oh they're looking at this little phone ah. but it it totally i thought the person was disengaged with the audience yep well so. and then i watched somebody last week give a speech and they read their notes the whole time so they're just reading their notes and i'm just watching them read another person in the same event actually had their notes on their screen so they're just looking at the camera they're looking at their machine or their screen and it makes more sense because then it looks like you're interacting with the audience mm. so i think really in a virtual world focus on your camera not on the people there is yeah. very important I, in a virtual world you need a moderator for a presentation because the speaker cannot be expected to be able to moderate the chat moderate Q and A or anything else, they need to be the star of the show. They so they need, they need to be present. So that's also very valuable. There's so many tips and tricks for virtual and for the virtual world. It's about interactivity. If you have a smaller meeting, we like to do things like a hundred people. Polls are great. Uh, Q and A is great. Um, some sort of activity. Like I did this webinar for 200 women a couple of weeks ago, and it was about being present in a virtual world. And I, I made a really loud noise and I told them at some point there will be a loud noise and a trivia question. And whoever answers it the quickest in chat wins a prize. And we did that and people were so engaged because they, I mean, we had like a hundred some come across all at one time. It was about who was the fastest. Mm. So if you tell them you're doing things like that, it really, it sounds silly, but it's about keeping people entertained and engaged. And if they're not engaged, they're not going to hear anything you have to say either. So if you're really just a talking head, it's the same thing on a, a real live stage. If you're just a talking head and you don't have any inflection in your voice and you just sound like this and you don't move around, you're going to lose your audience. So it's about keeping your audience engaged. So Andrew, Microsoft, talk about some of the things you use Microsoft. Oh, Microsoft is one of my favorite clients. We've been working with Microsoft for 25 years plus. Actually, it's even been longer than that. Um, but we work really in the event space at Microsoft. And then we work almost in every single group across Microsoft. They used to be called business groups and we were in every single one. Now they're not called that, but we're still there. <laughs> so we work with different execs and different teams crafting and creating their message in such a way that it inspires audiences. Now it can be an audience online. It can be an audience who reads an email. It can be an audience who hears a spoken word, or it can be an audience that needs a video 
to make a point. So what we do is we work deeply with those clients and those teams to create value for them so that they can put it out to their audiences. And their audience can be internal or external. It can be an audience that needs to learn something. We do training too. Or it can be an audience who just needs some quick information. So we do infographics as well. Anything that really inspires audiences in a visual way is what we're super good at. And Microsoft has been a client for years. We do a lot of work in the events presentation team, which is now called the experience or the experience team, I believe. Uh, and we have a lot of fun with that team as well. But then we work with other clients like CSEO is a client we work with. Olivia is amazing over there. Uh, we work with Daphne Elliott and have for years. Um, we work with Kelly Q and she's a lot of fun. Jade McCracken is one of my favorites. Uh, Lee Feldman. We do a lot of work with Lee Feldman, who supports Kurt Del Bene, who's one of my favorite clients as well. They're just fun to work with and they're different. Andrew, how'd you get into this business in the first place? Oh, geez. I mean, we're looking, oh, geez. we're talking like 25 plus years ago. What got you doing this? Well, we're talking 1988. So that's more than 25 years ago, yeah. my friend. Um, I started as an intern at an engineering firm uh, in Kirkland when I was 17 years old. I had just returned from Europe as an exchange student and I wanted to do something because being bored is not my thing. I don't like I like to have my time filled. So I started as an intern, as a technical illustrator for their training department, and there were no computers yet. So I started with regular paste up tools doing design. And then six months in, I got the putty colored Mac on my desk with, you know, one disc for PageMaker. It was fascinating and a lot of fun. So I was there for the beginning of desktop publishing and the beginning of computer aided mm -hmm. design. Uh, and it's been a ride, let me say. I worked for them for a number of years and then they uh, were purchased by a French company and they had me come in. I ran the team by that time. I'd been there seven years and I ran the design team and they called me in and they said, we need you to lay off your team. And I said, okay, I'll lay off my team. I, I mean, I was so young. I was 24 when I laid off my team. It was brutal. And I went through it and I did it and I was proud of myself and they called me in the next day and they laid me off. <laughs> And I went, how did you I do the dirty work? I know. They make you do the dirty work and then they let you go. Yes, exactly. Uh, but two days later, they called me and they said, we made a mistake. Uh, we need you to come back and bring one of your team members because we have to roll out a full brand change for the new company. And I said on the phone back then, because this is early 90s, I'm like, hold, please. I'll call you back tomorrow. I hung up the phone. I did some quick research and I drove to Olympia, Washington, to our state capital and bought a business license for Artitude's layout and design. Mm. Uh, and that was 1995, August of 95, when I, I was up and running. And what happened for me is I used, they were my first client. So I called them back and I said, great, I'm coming back and I'm bringing Sandy with me, but you're going to pay through my company. And this is how that's going to look. So they agreed. It was great. And then they had laid off a ton of people, like all the instructional design team had left, some of the marketing team. And they went to this little tiny software company in Redmond called Microsoft. And then my phone started ringing once people found that I had hung out my own shingle. And so I started with Microsoft in the games group uh, doing Flight Simulator 95. <laughs> it was years and years wow. ago. Yeah. Flight Simulator 95. So what did that look like at the time? <laughs> Uh, I helped do UI, so user interface design, and then I also did all of the collateral that came with it. So the, the book that came with it, so you could figure stuff out, I did that. Uh, if you Google me, I was on Asheron's Call too, which is a really cool uh, game years ago, and my name pops up at, in the credits. But I did so many games. And then 10 years in, I was a contractor hiring contractors, so I would ask other people to come work for me, but I, little did I know that the IRS frowns on that. So a freelancer hiring freelancers, there's no way to funnel any taxes or do anything else. And although everybody was 1099, I had one employee, employee, not employee, one contractor, excuse me, who was wanted for child support in two states. So I got a letter saying they were gonna garnish his wages and I just ignored it because he wasn't my employee. Just don't ignore the IRS, everybody. So I ended up hiring a lawyer and paying forty-seven thousand dollars in fees and fines because I hadn't been able for to prove that he was a contractor. Yeah. Oh, even for though the... no, it was, yeah. yeah. 
Wow. So, and that's how we started. And then I incorporated because the lawyer said, you know how to never have this happen again? You incorporate the company. So I did. And now here we are. That's amazing. And I'm pretty happy about it. Yeah. Well, you know, Andrea, you work with, all, I mean, people see on your, your page, you work with Starbucks, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Expedia. What were some of the stuff you did for Expedia? A lot of presentation design support for Expedia, mm -hmm. where we would go in and talk to a speaker usually. That was interviewing speakers, and it's fun to create some of the stuff for them because it's different than some of the other companies we work for. So we would interview them and create really cool presentations for them that they can use in their different different one-on-ones or different one-on-tens or different one-on-thousand uh, speeches and audiences. How is working with startups different from these Fortune uh, 100, 500 companies? Well, we got a couple of things. Startups first have no money. <laughs> so that's one thing. We have a sliding scale for Starbucks or startups, not for Starbucks, sorry, for startups. Uh, but <laughs> one of the things we like to do for startups is we help them with their pitches, their pitch decks. So mm. pitch decks have seven to 10 slides that are normal in every pitch deck when you're going out for VC funding or first round. We're talking first round, not second or third here. So we would help them create their story and craft it so that they could get funding. Uh, and we still do that when they come to us. It's a lot of fun. It doesn't, it doesn't translate to a lot of revenue, but man, these people are excited about what they're yeah. doing and it makes us excited too. What's it's important fun. for them to include in their story? Uh, their story. Yeah. <laughs> They so often don't of, even include that in the pitch deck. Exactly. They hmm. often don't include it. They just say, this is my product. These are the people on my team. This is how much money we put into it. This is the timeline. This is our marketing plan. Great, but it's dry. Who are you and why should they buy into this? Why should they jump on your train versus somebody else's? Hmm. What's one what of the fit your favorite interviews oh, so that you've far? done? Because you have a lot of amazing... <laughs> Uh, women leaders who you featured on the podcast and they kind of, you know, you get up close and personal and they talk about a lot of different things. What's Every one, that, one of maybe them? what's like a story that sticks out to you that listen, all of them are good, but like this, this story of, from this person really sticks out that start here mm -hmm. maybe. So there's so many good interviews that I've done and a lot of them that haven't even been published yet. And the stories that I get and the connection I get with these people is fairly deep, fairly quickly. One of my favorite stories is Jean Thompson. She's the CEO and owner of Seattle Chocolates. And it was kind of how she jumped into it. She didn't start out in chocolate. She started out in marketing at Microsoft. And she was a marketer for a big tech company. And then, you know, she was at Microsoft early days. And so she got some money out of stock and she decided to invest in Seattle Chocolates. And a few years in, uh, Seattle Chocolates was going to go under unless mm. somebody stepped up. And she was on the board then because she'd invested money. And she said, hey, I'll do it. I'll come in and help you with some marketing. And so eventually and very quickly, she became the CEO. And she's just rocked it. She's made this company that has it also creates value because they have a social justice and, and they then they add so they do chocolates through her second company called J Coco, where hmm. it's a one for one, where you buy a chocolate bar and then somebody gets a free meal. So they donate hmm. meals to um, nonprofits around Washington, but also someplace else that help feed the hungry. So she just she has such a beautiful heart. There's a social favorites. impact embedded yeah. in the company. So where what's the website for that? Where can people check it out? Mm. Is it Seattle Se Chocolates? Seattle chocolates. Yeah. Okay. And then her sub brand is J Coco, J C O C O. Okay. And that's the brand that they do a one for one where they give back oh, cool. to the community. Yeah. Wow. She's just so cool. <laughs> um, Andrea, the, I want to talk about, you talked about some of the, some like four life altering events. Mm -hmm. Um, what's something on the flip side that you're especially proud of after this, you know, 25 plus year journey, with your company, what's a proud moment for you? Mm, there are a lot of proud moments, but really I always try to push that onto my team because it's their moments. Mm. Really, honestly, um, I would say one of the best things that ever happened for us is that we won best places to work. But we've, we've actually won it twice. We won it for Seattle Business Magazine, which was a really big deal because we tried for four years and we finally won number one a number of years ago. 
uh, but also for the Puget Sound Business Journal because they do the best places to work every year. And I want it in and I want it in. And so finally, I can't just say I want in. It's They're not going to do that. Your team or my employees had to actually answer questions and vote us in. Mm. So those are super proud moments for me. The, the other thing I would say right now is that we're still here, that we're still standing. Uh, when we've had a lot of our work has been slashed, we're down over 30% in the live event world or even more in the live event world, but we're making up for it now in the virtual event. And it's about the word that I hate right now is pivot, but it's about pivoting and being what our clients need in a way that they didn't know they needed it. What should other companies be doing as far as culture that you do to become a best place to work? Listen to their employees. I got to tell you, it's not the Andrea show. It used to be before I figured out that it couldn't be. I am there to serve. I am with my company to serve the people who work for Artitudes. Uh, and what that means listening more than anything else that means listening. So today we talked about, should we go virtual completely and totally virtual and absolutely no one had any qualms about it. In fact, they prefer it. Now I grew up in a time where if I didn't, you know, if they didn't see me working, I wasn't working. So I really have to realize that I have to trust my people. Uh, but for me, it's about listening uh, and making sure that every voice is heard. So Every six months, we do something called Start, Stop, Continue, and I send it out to my team, and it's anonymous, not to me, but to everybody else, but they tell me what they want Artitudes to start doing, what they want Artitudes to stop doing, and then also what they want us to continue doing, mm. and we dissect and we talk about it as a team without making, we make it anonymous yeah. so that we can be what they need us to be so they can keep adding value for our clients. You know, um, Andrew, I don't know if you'll agree with this statement or not, but um, I think you know, I consider women, uh, business leaders, entrepreneurs, any woman like a superwoman because oftentimes, oh, yeah. especially if you have a family and you're balancing in, like I know in our household, like my wife's a superwoman. Like I don't know how she does everything <laughs> she does because, you know, she takes sometimes the brunt end of yeah. the kids activities and, and all the stuff that she has to run in addition to her business. So I don't know how she does it. I don't think I could do it. Um, so you how couldn't. do you? Yeah, I, I probably couldn't. You're totally right. And she does it with ease from the outside. And um, how do you balance the work and and the family? I don't believe in balance. Yeah. I believe in being someplace 100% when I'm there. So when yeah. I'm working, I'm 100% working. When I'm with my family, I'm 100% with my family. But what you're talking about for me is called the mom load. And so there's yeah. a constant stream in the back of my head. Okay, has Owen had his orthodontist appointment? Do I need to call the yeah. dentist back? Wait, I've got to get the dog to the vet. And still I'm having a conversation with you. And I'm also thinking about my next <laughs> meeting. So it is called the mom load and we're really good about it. And we're good at it overall, but we have to give ourselves grace in order to continue the steam train we're on um, or the steam roller, I guess I could say, because we have stuff every minute of every day. And I don't care who you are as a woman leader, or whether you have a family to take care of or a spouse to take care of or anything else to do outside of being a woman leader, you have a ton. There's so much that's in our minds. We have also to fight against stereotypes that men have created over the years and they are still there. Um, we also have to pick up the mantle of social justice because we truly believe in equality for everybody. And a lot of times this is the stuff that's playing on repeat in my head that honestly, they've proven that men don't have. So men are really good at doing what they do and they're outstanding at it usually. But women are good at what they do plus all the other things. Totally agree. <laughs> hey, Andrea, first of all, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you. Um, I want everyone to check out leadlikeawoman.biz. You could see there. Um, Artitudesdesign.com. You can see there. Are there any other places we should point people towards? Yeah, check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Andrea Houston, A-N-D-R-E-A-H-E-U-S-T-O-N. -E I have a voice for change and a voice for social justice and a voice for women on LinkedIn. I, in fact, one of my latest articles has over 1.3 million interactions. And it's called Never Apologize for Being a Strong Woman. Amen. Check it out. <laughs> Andrea, always a pleasure. Thanks, Jeremy. Right. I really appreciate the time today. You're wonderful. You too. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find.
in the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand 